terrific to have your company and um, I'm Alex from Triple Six but um, more importantly we've got two fantastic guests here tonight so um, we've already met um, the Honorary Consul of Malawi uh, Trent Smith and uh, he was appointed by the Republic of Malawi. He is the senior representative of the government and uh, we also have next to me Dr Nathan Stegall who's the general manager of WindLab. He is a co-founder of WindLab and a global leader in the field of wind resource assessment. It was quite great sitting next to him while um, uh, William was making that windmill. Uh, WindLab is a private company with headquarters in Canberra and uh, is wholly owned, um, it's got wholly owned subsidiaries in Canada, South Africa and the United States. So let me just uh, go to my guests. Uh, who wants to go first just with a general reaction? Yeah, I'll go. I mean, my first reaction, I actually really enjoyed the film. Um, but the thing that struck me all through it, the reason I enjoyed it so much was William himself. Yeah. He's just so likeable. Yeah. That's, that's why I enjoyed it, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I agree, uh, in fact, uh, with what Nathan just said. And, and I think the thing that strikes me about William is, is his, his English he struggles with, but you can tell he's a very rounded individual. You don't need to hear him speak to understand that there's a lot going on in that, in that yeah. mind of his. And you can just see, when you see it in his eyes, you, you can see him reflecting, thinking, and looking back and really in a way that I think others don't fully understand. He appreciates his history, he appreciates where he's come from, and I don't think others necessarily understand that, and I found that fascinating just looking into his eyes. There was a lot of the time when, I think there was a word used earlier on in the film which was masala, which was crazy people. And I was looking at, into William's eyes, like you said, and, and you were just looking at him thinking, he's looking at these other people thinking they're masala. Uh, <laughs> like, um, Tom Riley, you, you know, was, was being nice and trying to do the right thing, but then he sort of, oh, don't drink when you go to university and <laughs> don't do this. And it was, it was like your nagging parents or something, and you could just see it all the time in William's face. It was fantastic. Yeah, there's, uh, I just think, an incredible wisdom there. We have got a microphone here too, if you did, did want to make a comment yourself or ask a question um, of either Trent or Nathan. In terms of... what. It's, it's obviously just that whole simple thing of grabbing an idea and making it happen has inspired people. Um. Yeah, but fundamentally, the, you know, there's an issue that there's not enough education, there's not enough power in that part of Africa. So, uh, well, in all, in all of sub-Saharan mm. Africa. And Williams really just said, well, how do I solve this? Appropriate technology. <laughs> and oh, absolutely, and and WindLab knows that there's 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 plenty of wind resource across that part of Africa and across a lot of Africa. So so we're hoping ourselves to go and, you know, maybe do it on a slightly bigger scale, but essentially do a similar thing. And well, tell us just tell us a little bit more about that. Well, sure. I mean, um, so WindLab's got a uh, an office in Cape Town. We employ about twelve people there. Uh, we've been active in South Africa since 2007 and in May of this year uh, the first two projects that we've uh, that we'd actually actively developed moved into construction um, under contracts that have been put forward with the South African government. Now to put those two projects in, into perspective combined they are, will generate about 230 megawatts of total power and on average in average year they'll they'll provide about 700 gigawatts, gigawatt hours of power. Now, to give people some perspective in comparison to Malawi, that's about a third of what Malawi currently uses in total. So those two projects that WinLab have done in South Africa could provide about a third of Malawi's uh, electricity. Mm. And, and this is the sort of thing that we want to keep doing now, uh, obviously in South Africa, but in other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Trent, in terms of what that obviously... It's great business for yes. WindLab, but sure. for, for Malawi itself, the country. It's great to hear what Nathan said. And for me, it's, and for William, I'm sure, it's, it's what does it mean to have that extra electricity? And in some regards, you know, in an Australian context or even in a UK context, wind technology that WindLab has is it's terrific because it's, it's clean. And, and, and from our perspective, from the consumer's perspective, we're, we're a little bit more developed and so we say, well, a cleaner energy source is a better energy source. And in Malawi, it's, in many regards, it's going to be the first energy source 
for much of the country. Uh, probably in the urban areas, 40% uh, have electricity. In the rural areas, in countries like Malawi, fewer than 10% of the homes, in, in fact, a lot fewer than 10% of the homes uh, may have electricity. So the wind technology that WindLab has can bring to Malawi energy for the very first time. N not a luxury type of energy, mm. a cleaner, slightly better type of energy, but literally for the first time. And what that means for Malawi is far greater than we can even get our heads around. Uh, I sometimes speak about, when I talk about Malawi, and, and often get asked about the Millennium Development Goals, uh, in particular, uh, maternal mortality and, and child mortality. And people talk about those as health problems. And, and they are, and I don't want to discount that there is a health issue there. But in many regards, in a country like Malawi, uh, the role that clean water, irrigation, sanitation, electricity, roads, logistics, the, the, the role that they play in contributing, or if you like, conspiring to, to create what then masquerades later on as a health problem is underestimated. So what you know, electricity brings to Malawi solutions and contributions towards those bigger problems, mortality, and, and combating mm. some of those terrible sort of uh, diseases and things that are in Malawi. So, and that's what it really means. It's more than just you know, air conditioners and refrigeration. In a country like Malawi, it has a much bigger impact. Well, and, and for light, I mean, I, I was really struck by the library that um, William borrowed the book from. Yes, yes. You know, and having worked in PNG, and and you look at you just looked at the resources in that library, and think of the things that we throw out at Lifeline book fairs. Yes. Um, so essentially, I suppose it's a story too about resources and education that film yeah, as well. Yeah. If, wasn't if it? I'm not mistaken, at one point William was looking at his grandfather, and his grandfather yeah. was smoking, you know, the the crop of Malawi. Chop chop. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and it was. And he was rolling it up with an old, you know, kid's textbook or yeah. something. I couldn't exactly work out what it was, but it was, you could see in, Malo in, in William's eyes, he was sort of looking at him going, what are you doing, <laughs> <laughs> you, you masala? And, 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 and did, you, did you wonder, you know, from, from William, of course, saying I was bored and, and so I, I read this book and, and I built this windmill and he brought, you know, this light to however many houses and then the school. But he's gone off to Dartmouth. And, uh, I mean, what do we assume is going to happen from that now? I suppose he's been taken from his village. He, he says all the time, he said, I, I'm always thinking about things that I can do back home. Do we, but do we think he's going to go back home? I think so. Well, maybe not back home, but I think he's going to help back home. So maybe he won't end up okay. back home, but he, he, he seems very committed to helping. And... He looked absolutely terrified, to be honest, turning up at Dartmouth. And, you know, like all of us maybe were on the first day of university. But um, I think he will, he will help. Yeah. He'll, he'll and I think it was so interesting with, um, is it, what's the American's, the man, his sponsor's name? Tom Riley. Tom. Yeah. yeah. And when he was asked about why, and he said, oh, basically to be a father figure. And I was thinking that whole, that whole kind of um, statement about paternalism. Yes. And basically, that's what he was saying he was being. Yes. But paternalism is used as a derogatory. Yes, yes. Um, but I thought in this point, it was kind of simple and pure in a way. What, what do you think about that? A lot of African students, and certainly Malawian students, come to Australia on, on, on DFAT and AusAid scholarships. Um, at any one time, there's probably 2,000 or thereabouts uh, African students here in Australia. And the overwhelming majority of them want to go home. Now, when I say home, it may be Malawi, it may be Zim or wherever, but they want to go back to Africa. And it's, it's quite interesting in the, the, the diaspora that when you, know, when you talk to these people, they, they are doing this because they want to come to Australia, get the best education they can, get some fantastic contacts, respect Australia for doing that, but they overwhelmingly want to go home. Well, if you don't have the word stress in your language. Well, that was interesting, <laughs> yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. He was thinking very hard yeah. about it. And I thought it probably doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I think, so that's, I think yeah. that's Nathan's point as well, that, that I do think that William w will end up going home. Mm. I assume he probably will. But, but that's not a step backwards. I mean, today, Africa is the place to be. I mean, it's the fastest growing economy, seven of the fastest growing economies in the world. A fantastic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Incredible amounts of resources are going into forming new universities, new educational institutions. You know, in some regards, 
you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you might have said it, it's somewhat of a curse to have been brought up in Africa. And now everybody wants to be African. It is actually the place to be in the next 50 years. So the fact that William's going to go home, I think good luck to him. Mm. You know, that's the, and it was fantastic to, to see that school in South Africa with, you know, picking all those young leaders. Right. Yeah. yeah. And he... he he looked a bit like a rabbit in the headlights going there at the beginning as well, but he seemed to be right in his element by the end well, of it. He was I remember trying to do that kind of maths. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. So he's on, obviously on that incredibly steep learning curve and then to be ending up at Dartmouth. Um, you just want to know what, ha what happens yeah. next, don't well, you? He's obviously got the, 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 the innate ability and yeah. he's got the drive and the entrepreneurialism. So what they're, I guess, trying to do now is uh, apply some structure so that he can then channel that thinking and channel that energy. And everybody does it. I think it's a good idea mm -hmm. to go to university and, and put some of that structure around that sort of uh, creativity. Uh, but the balance is not having one dominate the other. And I, I mean, a school like Dartmouth is probably on the right track, I think. It's a pretty good reputation. Uh, and Nathan, I know you've sponsored this film tonight, which is, which is great. And is it because you, you want to um, perhaps, you know, get business in Malawi as well. But uh, well, I'm, look, I'm just wondering with that connection because... Well, building on what Trent was just saying, yeah. I mean, there are, you know, if you listen to some of the economists, Africa really is the place to be for the next 50 years. And we've got this great technology that helps us find, you know, the best wind farm sites uh, in, in new countries that we go to. So there are plenty of countries in mm -hmm. sub-Saharan Africa where there is really just not a, fundamentally not enough electricity, let alone not enough clean electricity. So we see that as a huge opportunity. And, and so that's really our association with sub-Saharan Africa and why we want to... Is it all business? Uh, look, I mean, when we... Personally, when I, when I first got into the wind industry, it was to do with climate change and because I wanted to make a difference there. But, of course, now it's... it's it is a business, so we've got to make a commercial return. But I think there's plenty of us who also feel very strongly that we're actually doing something positive for the, for the world and for Africa um, by getting involved and by bringing power to people that just don't have it. And by bringing power, we can hopefully you know, help them to uplift and do all those other... You so know, you do want that to be part of the story? You, absolutely, yeah. We want to be mm. part of that and to, to feel like we're associated with something really positive. Mm. Now, d did anyone want to um, ask some questions here? Because the fabulous Quentin will dash around with the microphone. While that's going up there, I just want to provide a bit of support to what Nathan just yeah, said. Yeah, no, no. I think that profitability and businesses should be in Africa. That's not and a dirty word. No, it's I'm not yeah, a dirty no, word sort of thing. And I, I, I gave a talk about this at, at the University of Sydney recently. Uh, this notion of, uh, of profitably solving. Um, poverty problems uh, that, that they mm. do go together. I think it's important that they go together uh, and certainly we encourage companies just like we like. Are, are there there mining companies in Malawi? There are mining yeah. companies in Malawi. In fact, what, what's there's, uh, there's some very large Australian mining companies okay. in Malawi which is one of the things that keeps me busy from time to time. And What are they mining? Uranium, um, among other things. Okay. In, that's the biggest um, sort of output of, of Malawi's mining industry. But, you know, some problems are best solved by governments. Some problems are best solved by NGOs. And, frankly, some problems are best solved by businesses. They're nimble, they're creative, they're well-resourced. And, and therefore, I think there is a role for that. Also, you know, private and, and mm. government partnerships as well. But uh, certainly, we fully support, you know, business as a solution to a lot of those, particularly, as I described earlier, logistics problems, which then start solving your health and education problems as well. They're very complex problems. And no one particular sector is uh, the right sector to solve it. Oh, that's a great point to make. Now, Quentin, we've got someone with a question. Hello. Hi, um, Muli, Muli Branji. <laughs> I actually spent some time in Malawi. so <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, actually, Nathan from WinLab, um, how you see uh, wind energy working in somewhere like Malawi in terms of energy affordability for villages like Williams? Um, and also, how do you see smaller scale uh, renewable energy projects and decentralised energy as opposed to large centralised systems as we have here. Yeah, I might go back to, this, to, to South Africa to give you a real example. So in South Africa, um, the recent renewable energy um, uh, bidding process for projects has delivered projects that have 
uh, power prices somewhere um, lower than 70 or 80 dollars a megawatt hour. Now, if you put that in the perspective of what else is available to South Africa, it's the cheapest by quite a margin of, of any electricity source. So that includes coal, that includes gas, that is certainly includes nuclear. Nuclear uh, recently selling in, in the UK for $150 a megawatt hour, which is... are pretty much almost zero in the sense that they're collecting firewood um, and obviously using some, some paraffin for lighting. And so, yeah, in that sense, for small villages um, that can't afford energy, that don't have the infrastructure at the moment, how does that sort of work? Well, as I understand it, in Malawi, demand far outstrips supply. So if, if we're able to deliver the cheapest energy essentially that there is now then we would expect that um, you know people will be able to take it i'm sure it's going to be a challenge for people to to pay for that power but we would certainly expect that people would be uh, able to take that up and that the electricity itself will act as a an additional economic stimulus to those you know to those countries uh, but i do accept your you know what you're saying that certainly for you know where people have nothing buying electricity in the first place will be will be a challenge. Any other questions? I missed your, your name. Maureen. Maureen. Um, it's good that you've been there. Not, not that many people have, so we're sort of talking on the same page. But, um, but bearing in mind that um, the deforestation that occurs by burning wood is not a costless exercise. There is a cost associated with that, with, with the results uh, of that. So just bear that in mind. Another, it's Quentin's. If there's no other questions, I might just, and it's, th oh, it's I'm down here, and then. So I do realise it's Thursday night. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, Trent, is it? Yes. Yeah. yes. Trent, um, to me, the film spoke to a Western audience, um, and I'm interested in your thoughts about how it would resonate with young people in Malawi and. Um, what would inspire them to um, take solutions up themselves, you think of solutions and, and take matters into their own hands as William did? Sure. Um, I just finished reading the book, and when I say just finished, this afternoon on the plane. Um, and I would encourage you to get a copy of the book. It's available, I, I think I bought mine from Book Depository or something like that, and, and to read that because you, you said the film talks to a Western audience. It was made for a Western audience. Uh, the book is is a lot longer. There's more information in that, and it really goes through William's story from when he is, you know, five or six years old, and and stops pretty much before Dartmouth. It, it goes through that, but it takes it from his perspective, and he talks about his friends in school, none of whom are really mentioned by name, certainly in the movie, and and there's a lot more information about that. And I think that the the Malawian kids aren't likely to be watching the documentary, they're more likely to read the book and I think that does speak to them and, and provides an inspiration because it's quite literally, William is quite literally one of their own. It's not some fictionalised uh, character, character or, 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 or a made up sort of construct of a person. It's real. Everybody knows him. Um, Malawi's got 16 million people but I assure you everybody knows who William is. Um, so I think that the, the Malawian kids, and I can't speak as a Malawian native person, but I can certainly say that the book uh, it takes his life a, a lot more in detail and I think a lot more people will be able to relate, Malawians will be able to relate to William through the book more so than they would through the movie. And I think that's probably going to be their main uh, point of access too. Even all the information, when you, when you Google William Kamkwamba, you know, there's you know, a million hits nowadays, but again, the typical Malawian students aren't going to be Googling e either. They're going to be hearing about William uh, through people they speak to, through, through the stories, through the newspapers in Malawi, through more or less print media in Malawi. So I think the story that, that there's almost two stories being told and I would recommend the book to you. And there's one, um, if anyone else has read the book, you, does anybody else read the book? Just out of interest. There's a few people here. I wonder if you picked up, when I picked up, what he was thinking when he was looking at the Labrador dog. You'll know without spoiling the story what happens. He has a dog called Kumba. And I'm surprised that they didn't talk about it, and that's probably good that they didn't talk about it. But 
but let's just say that uh, the human humans aren't the only victims of famine and uh, that was also a point that I was trying to make earlier when you looked into his eyes to see what he was thinking to see some pain in there and again there's a lot more revealed in the book and I and I would strongly recommend you you read that Doug you can't see that film being shown when they all went to watch the soccer the football yeah, well, yeah. and you know and you, you can see that you know that's going to get rolled out probably in groups like that mm. around the country mm. don't you think? and there's TED talks also yeah. in, in Malawi as well so Absolutely. Yeah. But I just at the village level I'm sort of talking about, it's more likely that, that the story will get out in more depth than yep. a 90-minute sure. video. Any other questions around? Did, did you just want to sort of go to a, your final sort of thoughts about uh, it? Just on William, he's just, he, <laughs> wants to, he wants you to think he's a regular kid, and I, I think he is really. And, you know, he, he wants to watch football with his mates and talk to girls and, you know... I still want to know the score of oh, was, was a, got, you, I think you got the biggest laugh when he, when he first saw that display of himself. Yeah. And he just stood there. And yeah. He's like, what's going on? He yeah. hasn't got the celebrity thing. He's, you no. Know, <laughs> actually. It's nice, though, that he does It's do beautiful. That, it? it's, yeah. it's, it's the essence of William, I think, yeah. isn't it? My closing remarks are just to say thank you, everybody, for coming and listening to his story and, and getting involved and understanding about... Malawi and wind energy into Maureen's question and, and to everybody and to Alex too. So, thank you. Oh, no, I, I found it fascinating. You've taken the time to be here tonight. No, no. It's, it's late and also this afternoon and just the interest and enthusiasm that people show for a country like Malawi is fantastic. So I want to go you. there. <laughs> Look, please thank um, Trent Smith, um, the Honorary Consul from Malawi and uh, Dr Nathan Stegall, General Manager of Windlab and also thank um, the... Uh, staff of the National Film and Sound Archive, Quentin and all the other friends, thank you so much for all the efforts you're putting into this film festival as well. Thanks so much. And thanks to you. Good on you for coming. <laughs>